listener. Welcome to Talent Chasing, where we bring real-world stories from the fields, courts, and pitches of major league sports and offices of corporate talent. It's our job to amplify those hidden stories in finding, retaining, and motivating the best talent in the world because no team exists without great talent. Hi, I'm Brian Johnson, Major League Baseball player, former Major League Baseball player, and former Major League Baseball scout. I'm Jasper Spangart. I am a journalist and filmmaker. And I'm Chad Sowash, recruitment industry veteran. Welcome to episode number one, Jason Brian Johnson. Because like we, you think to yourself, where do we start with this? And we've got a sports star right among us so it's sort of the easiest transition to go from there um our very own sports star and co-host i may add brian johnson yes. um brian who exactly are you good question i've been worrying about that for the last 50 some odd years <laughs> uh but I, I guess i understand there may be one or two people on the planet that don't know exactly who i am do so some research me... on you dude oh yeah. my yeah. god let, let me do it let me do a brief <laughs> overview of uh of my role or, or one of my roles here today being part of the the guest but anyway uh. so i uh born and raised in oakland california a uh, large baseball hotbed frank robinson's from there kurt flood joe morgan a bunch of other baseball uh, uh legends uh, i grew up there i went to stanford university played football and baseball there i was a quarterback there as well as uh, uh on the baseball team we won two national championships there and then I went on to um, to play in the major leagues for 12 years. I uh, had a lot of fun there. Left there, went into the corporate real, world for nine years, went back into baseball as a major league scout. And we'll get into the differences of what a major league scout versus uh, uh, an amateur scout might be. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then I got, uh, I, I left baseball after, uh, left scouting after 10 years. So 22 years in baseball wow. and went back into the business world. So. Uh, a thumbnail sketch of who I am. That's me. Wow. That's, a, well, that, that's not a thumbnail sketch. That's a big sketch. That's a, whoo, that's, that's massive. Dude, it, it, that sounds more than one lifetime. Okay. That sounds like more than one lifetime, which is, which is why today we're going to start the discussion around the chase, which is what great teams do. They identify, they yep. engage, and then they chase talent, right? So in this case, it's all about chasing Brian Johnson, whether you can find him, the right one on Google or not. <laughs> There's a lot um, of them, yeah. Yeah, right. exactly. So the guy so the from ACDC, I, I, get, I get a lot of his stuff. <laughs> hey, man, I, I yeah. Wish, yeah, I wish I got his paychecks, but I, I did. So, yeah. <laughs> so, where, so where did the sports bug catch you, hit you? Where did all this start? Yeah. Uh, as a kid, you know, I, I kind of had a short attention span and all I wanted to do was be around the ball. Didn't matter what mm. ball it was. I played basketball. I played, I was playing soccer a lot or football. It should be called football, but that's a whole yeah. different story. We can get into another time, but we, for some <laughs> reason in the United States call it soccer, which is dumb, but whatever. Uh, but yeah, anything that had to do with the ball would have been, uh, I was locked up in it. And so just this natural, uh, really from my soul, kind of a connection with soul movement, athletic competition, and, and all that, it just kind of was my thing. Well, what was the f the first ball that you picked up? I think it was soccer. Uh, mm -hmm. My best friend, his dad was our was our coach. He was a orthopedic surgeon, and he was a, the, the 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 team doctor for the Golden uh -huh. State Warriors, who who were garbage oh, back then. Um, for <laughs> Laney College, was a, a local junior college there. Their football uh -huh. team and their soccer team. So, um, so he introduced us to soccer. I didn't know anything about soccer until we started playing together. So, at uh, seven years old, we started playing and and had a blast. So that so was were those my, pickup that was my matches? first game. Huh? Were those like pickup matches? You had your buddies in the backyard. Did you go to the park? I mean, what was the what was the scene, especially in Oakland? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, soccer on the park was would is kind of it's around, right? There's uh -huh. there's always yeah. it's more of an adult thing. Ours was more the you know the t-shirt league for soccer and for baseball. Mm -hmm. um, where I really got in, uh, serious about it was with, with baseball because uh, to your point, the the leagues and soccer didn't really start to your ten. So yeah. probably the first one was baseball. T-shirt league is what we called it. You pay, your mom, you know, your parents would pay 10, 15 bucks. You get a T-shirt and a hat. You come down to the to the to the recreational park at eight uh -huh. o'clock in the morning, and you stay there all day. You play your game at nine, 
Yeah. But you get to substitute in the game at 8.30 and then 9.30 in the game at 11 and 12. <laughs> and when you're not playing in one of those games or substitute another game, you go play three flies up in the outfield. You play yeah. pick, <laughs> pickle or rundown is what we called it back then. Yeah. Yeah. You play pepper. A lot of, like, I've, been, I've coached a lot too. So a lot of kids nowadays don't know what pepper means. It's the great game um, with just you can do with just one person, one ball, or two people, one bat, and one ball. Uh, so, yeah. So baseball is probably – as far as getting serious about it, was probably my first uh, endeavor into that. Well, talk about talk about o- Oakland a little bit. What was the yeah. environment in Oakland? Because as a kid, I mean, I grew up in small town Ohio, right? We didn't have big major league sporting uh, teams, right? You did, right? Mm-hmm. You had you grew up in the shadows of that. So talk a little bit yeah. about talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it was a great time. It was the Charlie Finley Oakland A's of the of the early seventies. They won three World Series in a row. Wow. The Oakland, the Oakland Raiders was Otis Sistrunk. And, oh yeah. And <laughs> John Matuzak and Kenny Stay were the snake. Yeah. You know, so we had all those characters around, you know, for uh-huh. our the Warriors had just before the Warriors won the championship in seventy four. Uh-huh. But I cognitive I didn't re, cognitively I didn't really check into seventy five, seventy six. So I suffered for 40 years until the latest uh, dynasty uh, 40 years <laughs> later. So that's a whole separate subject too. But, but yeah, so, but, but yeah, I, I grew up in a, I grew up in the city of Oakland, but a little tawny white uh, upper middle-class suburb called Montclair. Okay. And so my father is a cardiologist. My mother was an emergency room nurse. So, um, and, and a lot of the kids in that field that I would go to every morning uh, were white. And there was one girl who she was awesome. Uh, Sarah Lillivan was her name. Uh, and there was a couple sprinkle of, of, of diversity, sprinkle of, of different folks, black folks mostly. Didn't have a whole lot of Asian folks. Didn't have a whole lot of Latino or Hispanic folks. Mm-hmm. And so uh, from there was kind of where I started and got to be playing. And ironically, what happened to me, which changed my life, is that uh, when I got into the first organized league where you get the full uniform, Mm-hmm. Um, my coach was a black guy. He was going to law school at uh, Cal Berkeley, which is right next door. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he was in the middle of law school. He and his two law school buddies, the three of them coached this little league team. And so when he, when my head coach, uh, Dennis Young, my head little league coach, uh, noticed that I had something that was a little bit different. He took me off and we were up in the hills of Oakland. He took me off of the hills and took me down into the flatlands. So in Oakland, there's the hills. And there's the Flatlands. Okay. So the Flatlands is where the best athletics were, the best teams were, the best athletes were, the best competition. And they were all black communities for the most part, sprinkle of Latino and Hispanic folks. Uh, again, not a whole lot of Asian folks. Asian folks kind of lived on a different side of town. They were kind of across the bay in San Francisco. Uh, but in Oakland, uh, that's what we had. So this uh, predominantly black city, uh, mm-hmm. this white kid went to start playing in those leagues and it transformed my life. What was your what was your favorite part of growing up there? Uh, we uh, we had a beautiful view at our house. We mm. got to see the San Francisco Bay, uh, the Bay Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge behind it. All of that I got to see every morning and every day, mm-hmm. uh, and it was a, a really a delight. And that I look back on having not been there uh, for a long time. But the other piece is that because there are so many different types of people. There's mm-hmm. so many different types of Asian people. There's so many different types of Latino folks and Hispanic folks. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the black folks were were varied, right? They came from so many different places. Um, that for me was my favorite part of it, and still to this day is the richness of the culture of Oakland. And if you ever meet anybody from Oakland, they'll tell you pretty much the same thing. We're all very arrogant about where we came from. We yeah. know it was unique. We know yeah. it was different. And in my life, I'm 56. I've never seen another place like Oakland anywhere uh, in yeah. my travels. Yeah. Wow. So talk a little about, you, you talked about the coach that, that first saw that you had a little something, right? Mm-hmm. Talk about the, the mentors. I mean, I, that, that to me, uh, for, for any kid, any kid, whether in sports or not, I mean, that's a big part of their, their, their upbringing in, in their life, whether it's family, whether yeah. it's a coach. So, so talk a little bit about that. Who, who were your mentors that actually brought you along, whether family, coaches, who were they? Who were the most important ones to you? Yeah, the first one I'd say was probably my mom. Hmm. Um, she and I were always best friends, still best friends to this day. She's 86 and plays golf five days a week. 
I um, love it. Wow. <laughs> I it's love still it. Dri- it's still driving. Uh, still, still driving. driving. <laughs> yeah, she don't necessarily remember what day it is today, but she can do everything else. But anyway, she was, um, you know, again, she grew up in the 30s. She was a golfer. Her father was a golfer. Mm-hmm. And so she became really good and was good enough at the end of high school to be a pro, potentially a pro golfer. But again, so she born in the 30s. Uh, so as a teenager, eight, so that's basically 51, 52, 50, mid 50s. There's mm-hmm. not a whole lot of money to be made for female yeah. golfers during that time. Definitely. So she was like, eh, there's not a whole lot of money there. I'm going to go to nursing school and do my thing there. But that love of sport, that, that hand-eye coordination, which was key, because my dad didn't have a whole lot of it. My mom was the one that had it. And, but we connected on sports always. And so I think she was great. And she always used to tell me that, uh, hey, because, you know, I felt like I was, you know, in, impressing people at 10 or whatever. I, I felt like I was big on the field, right? But my, <laughs> but my mom would always say, hey, just remember, there's always going to be somebody better than you. And that okay. always stuck with me. And it, you know, it, she didn't have to, again, I, you know, I've done a lot of coaching. I got two kids that I coached along the way and I refuse to be that parent. So uh, but we can get to that later. But the example I'm using as my mom is that she never pushed me to do anything. She okay. never said, Hey, you got to work harder. Hey, you got to do this. She said the other thing, the, the other way around, she said, there's always someone better. And that kicked into where I was not going to let anybody uh, outwork me. And so my that's where my attitude came from. I said, oh, there's somebody better. Let me see. And so that kind of from 12 years on, uh, 12 years old on, was kind of my mentality of okay, even if I'm not the better player on day one, maybe by day five I'll I'll catch him. So mom's that's, DNA. That's yeah. the that's the sports DNA, huh? And yeah. I, I apparently dad was not a surgeon. That's what I'm hearing. He's not good with his hands. <laughs> <laughs> True. He was not. He was not a surgeon. Yeah, probably not good with his hands would be would be accurate too. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, so many other mentors along the way. But that was the first one. She was the the first one and the big one. Um, Joan Jet because she drove too fast uh, was her nickname around the, the neighborhood. Oh, that's it. Uh, so yeah, she she was the first one and has been with me for this this whole ride along the way. But was it that's tough amazing. to them because? I think the mindset of there's always someone better than you, uh, you just went into it slightly. And I I might want to dive into that a little bit because it is a form of parenting where you go, hmm, there's always going to be someone better than me. Because, okay, it motivated you. It is a bit passive aggressive. aggressive. (laughs) I know she was jetting down all the lanes there in Oakland, but it's a bit bit in your face, I guess. Um, uh, What did that? What did that do to your psyche, though? Because you you're always think everywhere you 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 were going to go from 12 on, you were thinking someone was going to be there and it was going to be better than you. Yeah, sure. Great question. The um, yeah, because at first I was I was offended. I was hurt. Yeah, I get it. I was like, in my mind, I was like, what? You're supposed to be in what my corner, mean? mom. What do you mean? Aren't I the apple of your eye? Yeah, we got three of my three other siblings. Yeah, okay, whatever, them too. But, uh, you know, what, what kind of thing? So I, for a long time, to your point, for a long time, I kind of took it as, wow, she doesn't think I'm good enough. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it wasn't until, obviously, later, I matured a little bit mm-hmm. since I was 12. And I realized, whoa, that was amazing. Now, I didn't use that with my kids. Well, I used it in kind of different context because okay. so with my thing, as I had my kids, everybody knows your dad was a, was an athlete. Everybody knows your dad played in the major leagues. Everybody knows yeah. that. So there's yeah. pressure, inherent pressure on the kids of a former mm. athlete mm-hmm. to be great, to be great right out of the shoot. Never fail. Yeah. If you make an error, well, your dad never made an error. Or if you strike out or you hit a home run, oh, your dad's home run probably was way farther than that. So, you know, that whole trip. But what was nice is that I didn't raise my kids in Oakland. I raised them in Detroit, Michigan, so no one knew me. Mm. And so I had an opportunity to really have a clean slate as a parent. But I tried to kind of take the lessons of my mom and said, hey, be the guiding force here. Keep them humble. Keep them mm-hmm. working. Encourage. She did encourage. But you can also give them some, hey, say, hey, you're, you're 14 years old. Hey, you're 16 years old. Hey, you got to keep moving because you got to be able to have that mentality of you want competition you don't shy away from competition. 
Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And I'm not meaning to hate on your mother's parenting skills because I, 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 right I'm, thinking, asking, I'm thinking I would like your, your mother. phone number is. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, <laughs> apparently it worked, okay? Apparently it, did, it worked. It, I mean, you can say loads of things about it, but it, it did work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, if we were to, because you, you dived into it a little bit too, like being aware of the fact that you're good at something. Um, I feel like, especially now where you've got 12 year old kids putting up their highlight reels on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok (laughs) and you, and they've already, they've come to a sort of platform where you were, you perhaps as a kid 10 years ago, you were striving to to possibly be there in the future one day. And Mm. now they're putting out highlight reels and everyone's telling them how good they are, but how dangerous is it for, for that to happen though because if 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 everyone's telling you you're, you're great at something yeah. as a kid you're going to believe it right you're going to yeah. think well except for your mum maybe she's going to say you want to believe it you, you have to believe it maybe yeah. even to be successful but what was that like for you growing up growing up in Oakland that at that age because it's i yeah to to stay even keel is quite tough yeah i, I would agree I, I think it was easy on one part for me to be even keel because there was so much talent in the city mm. during that time uh, during that time, there was talent everywhere. There's so there was four or five of us from that era that went to the major leagues um, that Jeez. played. Uh, like a couple dozen of us went to major uh, division one sports in several different sports. So uh, mm-hmm. there, a, a ton of talent during that era. Um, but I would say also, yeah, it's tough for kids nowadays to keep that same mindset that I was able to keep because mm-hmm. I strove to be seen. Right. Exactly. Well, part of my motivation is to be exposed and be seen, show what I can do, show my wares and compete against other people. And this instantaneous video that can go viral, you know, and you can you can you can have your own you can have your own company in your living room and sell your widget on the other side of the planet. I mean, yeah. I, that just wasn't it when I was coming up. So it 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 not a criticism of what it is now. Mm. It's a it's an understanding that I didn't have that. And thank God I didn't. I could focus on what I like. I could focus yeah. on trying to reach that level and get to where I needed to go instead of giving all the great gear and, and the, the thing, I mean, I got, you know, newspaper articles that are written, right. That was about the extent of it, but now you can, your picture can be flashed up there. A video can be done over here. You can mm. have thousands of followers. It's a different world. And so I'm grateful for the time that I grew up and that I didn't have any of that. And I could just really get into the essence and the beauty uh-huh. of competition and sport. And I don't think a lot of kids get that opportunity. There's so many other things to to pull their time uh, so and, much and attention hype. away. So much hype. I mean, yeah. I actually had a friend. I was down in Atlanta. And one of my friends was uh, talking about how they were picking out music for their son's walk-up music. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we're talking, we're talking about yeah. yeah, high school. I mean, wait, this is this yeah. is travel. We'll get into travel teams. It, well, but- technology. I mean, technology is fun. I would have done the same thing. It's you know? fun, but and you would have too, I mean, Chad. Oh yes, you would have no, wanted to walk up music. Who <laughs> doesn't want to walk up music? I would, have, I would have loved that. But 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 is this is is it is it the the time of first and foremost? We I mean you you played multiple sports. So what, baseball, football, basketball, mm-hmm. and in in high school, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but today that's not how it's working out. We've got all of these 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 travel clubs. Yeah, uh, we've got all I mean, we've we've literally focused on Hey, look, you've got to be playing this one sport all year round. Yeah, right. Where I, I played for I was varsity letterman in four sports. Yeah, that was it. Right. I did not go <laughs> to college or anything like that, but I had an opportunity to go play it all and just enjoy myself. Exactly. Like sometimes yeah. it does not feel like whether it's walkout music or whatever it is. Right. It does not feel like these kids are getting a chance. Number one. Sure. To sure. enjoy themselves. And number two, there are a bunch of kids that are out there that can't enjoy themselves because they can't afford the $5,000 to be able to be a part of the travel club or what have you. And, and to be able to compete against the best. The experience. Yeah. They're, yeah. Well, yeah. they're missing the experience, even yeah. if they don't make it yeah. to True. college. Yeah. Right. I, I didn't, but I loved that experience. Right. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that, Brian. Yeah. I mean, and you're right. And during the time when we grew up, right. People would flock to sports. People love oh, yeah. sports. And even mm-hmm. it didn't matter if you were good or not. But now we're in an age, as you say, if you everybody who plays is going to be Tiger Woods. Everybody who yeah. plays is going to be Michael Jordan. Yeah. And so uh, what so I know we're going to do a whole different show later on on, on the 
the the the fleecing of the parents and and sport youth sports but that's not what you're asking for me in this episode for me i feel like the real sadness of it is that when my kid goes to uh try out mm-hmm. for the 10 through 12 year old team mm-hmm. yeah there's no such thing as keeping kids that maybe haven't developed yet that maybe yeah. aren't quite as good quite yet but they may be you know people uh, young kids grow like trees right they can yeah. at 11 or 12 they may be completely different so but they don't have a chance to play in any league right yeah. because the parents to your point got to pay so much money so you only take the top five guys or girls or whatever it may be, the yep. top five players. And right. so what do the other 50 players do? Back when I played, there was, like I said, the Recreational League, T-Shirt League, where yeah. we had 100 kids before they got to the full uniform league that could just play. No one cared. Yeah. No. yeah. no one cared. We hit off the tee first, then coach pitch, and then whatever. No right. one cared. You just got to play. You learned the game. You got to play. And that, I think, at, at its essence, if it's ever one thing, that was when the before the parents took over, before the, yeah. the almighty dollar took over. It could just be kids playing the game. And I feel like, and, and chiming in from a European perspective, because obviously you, you guys talk about travel ball and you talk about that concept, that doesn't really exist here. But the same stuff happens here because if you're a kid playing football, playing soccer yeah. football here in Europe, and you have to be sort of eight years old and you have to sort of choose which sport mm-hmm. do you want to pursue sure. like you can do field hockey you can do basketball well we're, we're quite short so no, no basketball okay <laughs> um so okay you play football and because you're taught at a really early age you need you can be good at one thing you can't be good at like four sports brian sure. we can't all we, we can't all be brian johnson <laughs> no chad was four sports i was only only three. Oh yeah school High school. In high school, yeah, but but <laughs> high school because Brian, you are a very uh, meticulous guy, and you asked us to do plenty of research. So, Uh-oh. as a journalist, I take you know <laughs> that very serious. That's a threat, man. That's a threat. So, but I also take my sources very seriously. So Brian, I went to your Wikipedia page. Um, no, like I, I do sort of fact check my stuff. So I came so across surprisingly a... accurate that page. Which yeah, you wrote it yourself, or I don't know who wrote it. Oh, it's surprisingly accurate. Well, good. Uh, but I also came across a post on Cougar Board. No, Chad, not that Cougar Board. Um, <laughs> it's all about BYU, guys. BYU, sports universities. Oh. But oh, I came okay. across this post and I loved sure. it. It's from 2005. And they're having a discussion about the best athlete they've ever competed with. And there's a comment from a guy called Pablo3. Uh, sorry, 393. Got to get it right because the people want to fact check this. Dated back to 2005. He says he was a senior at your high school in Oakland called Skyline High. That's correct, right? Skyline correct. High. Okay. Correct. So he says the year is 1985 and Gary Payton and Greg Foster were both juniors and Brian Johnson was a sophomore. Is that still, does that add up? 1985? Uh, we no, sophomore? we were all in the same class. Ooh. Gary, uh, Ooh. Greg and myself were all uh, juniors. Okay, Junior. So we're in the same class. Yeah. This is the first thing then that is uh, the problem's cool gotten wrong. It's yeah. close. It's close. It's, right. it's very right. close. Very no, awesome. but he yeah, says. Yeah. But this is now. I'm getting, we're getting to the interesting stuff. So yeah. he says most of you may I, know I'm Peyton a and nervous. Foster. I'm a no, nervous. no, we're so getting. No, trust me. Trust me. I'm it's good. okay. I'm so good. he says most of the most of you may know Peyton and Foster, known for their hoops, of course. But Brian Johnson was an all around stud. You may be actually be Pablo. This may not be written by an actual Pablo. I just kind of like Pablo. You like Pablo. I get it. But he says uh, uh, Brian Johnson may have been the best athlete of that group. Now, Brian, were you? <laughs> well, uh, no. Well, it depends on how you define <laughs> athlete. It depends on how you define athlete. Because yeah. um, Gary was always special in that way. Greg doesn't really count because he was seven feet tall. So it's kind of a, <laughs> you know I mean? it's hard. He had to be the height advantage. <laughs> and he was athletic. He was athletic, yeah. but, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to – he only played basketball, seven feet tall, still growing, still still early in his maturation. So uh, yeah. not a criticism of Greg, but he played in the NBA for a long time. He's coaching he did, in the yeah. NBA now. Uh, yeah. uh, so he's had an amazing career. Uh, but Gary was always special. So, um, it, again, de- depends on what you define as athletic. Um, but did Gary, go, did Gary play two sports in college? No, he was just one. 
Oh, he did. Okay. Oregon State okay. only played I, I, all the I, way through. Only played basketball. Yeah. I think. I think we've. I think we've settled that discussion then. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody he made, he made yeah. it to the Hall of Fame, so yeah. And, and he's and, chatting to us. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying yeah. to get Gary to come on the show. Right. Yeah. No, but I feel like you're right on the. Yeah. You're right on the athleticism part because you feel like you know with the NFL runs combines and you know, they measure guys' hands and, you know, MLB has obviously become data-driven to a T, as you well know. Um, and you've got, like, youth academies here in, in Europe where they, they're they tracking players at an early age with AI and they sort of want to measure everything they can possibly measure. But oh, yeah. how do you really measure athleticism? Because we, we're talking about it in Australia. It's a talking point, right? Athleticism. Mm -hmm. Okay, to be an athlete. Okay, you can play multiple sports. Well, Chad wins the athleticism contest if we were to try that. <laughs> I'm not sure that's totally valid. Um, but, like, how, how do you look at that, though? Because yeah. how can you consider someone to be an athlete? So, for me, for me, the way I do it, and again, this is coming from a scout. Uh, my job for 10 years was evaluating talent. Um, and I know we'll get into that another time. But uh, what I think... The best way to do it, because I'm a simple guy. I, I need you to kind of paint me a simple picture so okay. I can put my arms around it. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, the best way to identify a great athleticism is who jumps off the page at you. When you're watching the game, who mm -hmm. jumps off the page? Who is it that is really uh, spectacular? And it doesn't have to be the person to score the highest points. doesn't have to be the prettiest jump shot. Mm -hmm. But who athletically is dominating the, inter, the interplay? The, uh, you know, the, the dance routine on the floor or on the pitch or whatever may whatever field you may choose, the game will tell you who the best is. And, and that's what I, I kind of used as my scouting piece is that uh, you really just read the game and read the, the players within the game. They'll tell you and the cream will rise to the top, even in a, a five on five pickup game somewhere in the Netherlands uh, of a basketball player, uh, 10 basketball players. The best will you, it'll be just relax, just watch, and you'll know who the best athlete is on, on that group. So that's how that's how how I see it. Well, here's the segue. When did the scouts finally figure out that Brian Johnson was a guy who leaped off the page? Right? Exactly. How many times did you have to win, you know, best athlete in California before they actually started to show up and they started they started scouting you? Yeah, great question. Uh, nowadays, everybody has to pay to go to Florida, the state of Florida, for uh -huh. some tournament or California for some tournament in Southern California. And then everybody kind of flocks there. So if you don't have the money to mm -hmm. go to California, that part of California or to Florida or Texas, you're out of luck. And so for me, what happened when I was coming up is that the local colleges and the local and the sports, well, stay with baseball, the baseball teams, their scouts lived in the area. Right. Mm -hmm. Their scouts lived there. And so there was the, the they done their their homework. And so they had a feel for the competition level in the city. And so I was watched early on because when I was our school was three years, sophomore, junior and senior. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so as a sophomore it was our first year in high school, I start off a junior varsity for like a game, I think. Mm -hmm. And and our team that year was the state champion. We were number one in the state in baseball. And I was on the uh, uh, junior varsity for one one game, and then I came to varsity and, you know, dominated. So that was when I first splashed on the scene. And so the local scouts took wind of that. They read the articles. They saw things were around there. So our team getting more and more notoriety. So all of us within the team were getting mm -hmm. noticed, and the seniors more so. But then, as I say, scouts are trained to do this. Who jumped off the page for them? Some of them said, hmm, that – that little kid over there who had a lot of hair at that point, <laughs> uh, that little kid over there, that's somebody I want to keep an eye on. So they kept an eye on me for the next two years. And then when I was a senior in high school, um, I had been a two-time All-American and I was drafted uh, up until the day before the draft. I was uh, projected to be a number one draft pick first round. Mm -hmm. And back then it was like $160,000, but college was a whole lot cheaper back then. Everything oh, was God, cheaper yeah. back then. Yeah, so really. it was all relative. But um, I was called and told by the Giants, they'd take me in the second round if I was still there. Cincinnati Reds would take me in the first round. Boston Red Sox would take me in the first round. And so once we got to the day before the draft, they called with a little more serious tone of, listen, if we draft you here, we need to know if you're going to sign. 
Because mm-hmm. if you if we draft you and you don't sign, someone's going to lose a job. Yeah, yeah. Because that's that's serious capital for an organization, a first yeah. round pick. Makes and sense. I was a yeah. catcher, you know, a catcher that can hit was kind of my forte. And but I was also throwing ninety four off the mound as a pitcher. So it was another team wanted me as a pitcher, whatever. But there, because I was in high school and the, the athleticism was there, um, that there was a, a willingness to kind of take a chance on that. So, uh, but I so the day before the draft. I had a conversation with my parents and my mom, especially. And she's like, Hey, what are you going to do? If you, if you get drafted, you're going to sign. And I was like, well, I kind of like just the idea of being drafted. I want to go to school. I want to go, I want to go to Stanford and play football and baseball. Mm -hmm. Um, But it'd be cool to just have that, you know, have that button on my shirt that I got drafted in the first round. And she was like, no, Mm -hmm. that's not how, that's not how things are done. That's dishonest. That's cool. So if you have no intention of signing, you call those people up and tell them, thank you, but you're not signing. And that's what I did. Uh, she was right. And I called everybody up, said, hey, appreciate it. But I'm not going to, no matter what you offer me, I'm not going to take it. I want to go to school. And um, and so uh, I ended up not going in the first round, but mm-hmm. the uh, Montreal Expos in the 30th round, the last round at that point, 30 rounds back then. Yeah. The Montreal Expo, Expos, the only uh, telegram I ever received in my life. I got a telegram. <laughs> From, um, from a renowned Union. scout during those days, uh, he wrote the telegram. He's like, "Hey, appreciate, uh, respect your opinion, or re- respect your decision." Uh, and this is a team that I had never heard of before. I hadn't no. even kind of been in contact with the Montreal Expos at that point. Mm-hmm. But said, "Hey, if you change your mind, the Montreal Expos would love to have you." Type thing. And so that was the high school experience, and and um, and it, it was kind of a, a bizarre, bizarre time. Now, is well, there a scout? Is there a yeah. scout in college that was like he he felt like he just picked up a big bag of gold? I mean, you were getting ready to go into possibly Good. first round major first league round baseball. Pick. Yeah. Yeah. And now, oh, wait a minute. Now we've got the guy, we've got him falling into our lap. Not only well, that, it, you you yeah. you were two sport, you were two sports, right? Quarterback yeah. Yeah. and obviously baseball. So so tell me about that. Yeah, it's kind of funny how that happened too. Um so I did not – I got a letter from the baseball team, whatever. Uh-huh. Um, but in the summertime – so I, I got my – well, in the summertime, I went to a football camp because mm. I was getting some offers for football, but uh, it was a little little tepid at the time. So my, my running back and I from high school, Raymond Sanders was, was his name. Uh, he would go on to Cal Berkeley as a running back and really had a great career there. Um, but we went to this camp at Stanford. And it's like okay. an hour away, but we neither one of us had cars, so it was like on the other side of the planet for us. Yeah. But so we go to this camp, and there was uh, Mark McGuire's brother, Dan McGuire, there. Um, uh, there was a bunch of guys there. There was the year of the quarterback coming up in California, so it was a whole bunch of some of the best prospects across the country. It was John Elway's uh, camp. Oh, uh, he right. ran the camp. Okay. His his dad, Jack Elway, was the head coach at Stanford. Mm. So it was a John and Jack Elway football camp. So as it turned out, Raymond and I did really well. We played on the same team. We kind of dominated. Our, our group won the little championship seven on seven. And so we really were able to kind of turn some heads there at the camp because there's a bunch of other schools that come to recruit. Well, right. it just so happened that Stanford saw me and, and liked me and liked that I was local. And so anyway, I ended up uh, um, going there or, or thinking about going there. But the baseball coach heard from the football coach that they were going to give me a scholarship. And then all of a sudden I became more attractive because they already had the number one recruiting class in the nation. Uh, okay. And then they, they added in me on to it in, on, in for baseball. Yeah. Because okay. we, okay. we won on the national championship in baseball my freshman year and sophomore year, back to uh-huh. back. Right. And, uh, and the only two championships they have, the Stanford baseball, though they've had some great teams there. Uh, yeah. And hopefully they'll win this year. But um, so anyway, so I was there. So the baseball wanted me to come play baseball and football. And I was like, great. But I, I asked for, I kind of negotiated a little bit. I said, listen, I don't want anybody pulling me in one direction or the other. Cause right. I was going to go the, uh, I was thinking about university of Michigan and university of Arizona or UCLA. And mm-hmm. each of those examples, the, the, either the both, either, or the football coach or the baseball coach would pull you Jasper oh, to yeah. your point, pull you to, to specialize, pull you yep. into and be solely our guy. And mm. I said, I don't want anybody doing that. Don't do that. I'll come to Stanford and I'll play both football and baseball, but I want to be able to play both all four years. And they agreed. Now, it didn't happen necessarily that way, but they but they agreed. They still pulled a little bit, but it wasn't bad. 
And uh, it was an amazing experience to, to be able to play two sports, have fun kind of still as a kid mm-hmm. and uh, and really get an opportunity to, to show what I could do. And, and I, I was very fortunate to come up during that time when that was still allowed. Is baseball, was baseball your favorite sport or is that just the one that you were better at? So yeah. maybe, maybe it did become your, your favorite because you were better <laughs> yeah. at it. <laughs> well, I think basketball was my favorite. Really? Okay. Basketball was my favorite, but it was my, I was, I was not as good in basketball as it was the other two. Like I could street ball, like one-on-one, yeah. like on the, that I was good with that. But four other guys on the court, much less nine other guys on the court. Oh, that's too much. That's too much going on. Yeah. Anyway. So I didn't, I was not as good in basketball, but within football and baseball, I really loved them both. I took baseball a little bit for granted um, because uh, everybody kind of knew me as a baseball guy. So, mm-hmm. you know, I was kind of driven by challenges. So I wanted to prove I was a football player too. So, um, you know, at being the quarterback, there was a whole lot of time commitment. So it took away from my baseball a little bit. And I didn't really play that great at the college level for baseball. Um, so, but at the end of the day, so I had to have a conversation with uh, our head coach was Dennis Green. Mm-hmm. At the time, uh, Coach Elway had been fired. Uh, a whole really? different, whole different, whole for different story to that. Dennis Green. I was involved. I was involved in the process to get him out. Um, I can say that now. I'm 56. I don't have to worry about. <laughs> you don't care anymore. <laughs> right. I don't care anymore. But there was a coup. There was a coup d'état at our school. Really? Uh, over Jack Elway. Yeah. Ooh. And so myself and about eight other guys. There was a lot of things going on. But um, anyway, so he was removed. Dennis Green who had just come off Super Bowl wins with the San Francisco 49ers came in. Yep. He was the uh, – he he learned under um, – uh, not George Seifert, but the, um, uh, you know, the big guy, the blonde guy, um, San Francisco 49ers head coach. Yeah, well, um, um, Wal- Bill Wal- Walsh. Bill Walsh. Walsh. Walsh, yes. Bill Walsh. So he was a Bill Walsh protege. So he comes out to Stanford, takes, off, t- takes over. Mm-hmm. And so uh, at the end of my time there – uh, there was a possibility that I might get drafted football and I had mm. already been drafted in baseball and there were some whispers of maybe get drafted again for baseball. And so I went to uh, Dennis Green and said, Hey man, here's what I'm facing. What would you do? Should I come back play another year of football? Should I go ahead mm. and play? If I get drafted to go play baseball, I really like playing football, but you know, do you think I'm good enough to play in the NFL? Essentially is what I was asking. Mm. And we had a great relationship. We had a great conversation. He's like, well, he's like, he's like, I can't tell you that. It didn't help me at all. He's like, <laughs> he's like, I can't tell you that. You got, you got to do what you love more, and blah blah Smart blah man. blah. Yeah. And he really didn't help me at all. But so I had to really grow up and say, okay, business decision. Yeah. What, what do I need to be good in football? I needed a perfect offense because I'm six two, so mm-hmm. I'm not six five. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't run like the wind, but I can move around the pocket well and get my, get myself ten yards. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I could dominate in baseball tomorrow mm-hmm. as a catcher. I was yeah. bigger as a catcher. I could hit as a catcher, which made me unique. So yeah. I felt like I need the right offense for football, but tomorrow I can dominate. So that's kind of what it came down to, a business decision of not what I enjoyed most because I'd go play basketball if that was it. It was yeah. from a business standpoint of which one will, was better for me to, to, to put all of my time in now. Uh, and that's how baseball became the ultimate decision. So we always hear about, how the speed of play is so yeah. much different, at least on football on the football side of the house from one, one level to the next, right? You mm-hmm. go from high school mm-hmm. to college speeds up dramatically, go from college to, you know, to, to the pros it's warp speed. Mm-hmm. What was that like for you? What was yeah. that the case? Did you, were you just a man playing a boy's sport in high school and then you came into college and it was like, I'm here, I've, I've made it. Or was there a huge difference in speed? Did you have to get used to a lot of things on foot on the football side and baseball side? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Uh, absolutely. Cause, cause that is the, the defining factor yeah. in, in, in the two sports that I experienced. And I'm, I know it's basketball too. I've heard that, but it is the speed. Um, and so it takes a little while to get used to. That's why the athleticism that comes into play is so important because if you're an athlete and you mm-hmm. have sound fundamentals, so mm-hmm. that's why coaches harp on fundamentals so much is because if you have sound fundamentals, right, where your footwork is correct on turning a double play, mm-hmm. if your feet, if you're able to utilize your lower half as a hitter to, to generate thrust and power to hit the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, as a, as a quarterback, if you're able to use your legs and your feet to be more accurate as a passer, 
as a, as a, as a, as a guard in basketball, you use your shoulders correctly and your feet correctly to be more accurate. If your fundamentals are sound, you can adapt to the speed of the game. If your fundamentals are not sound and inconsistent, yeah. when the game speeds up, you're going to get spit out by the game and you're not going to be able to adjust. <laughs> so that's the difference. That's the essence. Again, I like simple stuff. Yeah. You're, if your fundamentals suck, you will suck as the speed picks up on yeah. the college level or the pro level. Because yeah. it's only going to get faster, right? It's only going to get faster exactly and faster right. like the higher you go. So, so, so and you can't and you and if you have to unlearn bad habits, you're losing time. It becomes a matter of time and speed. Right. You got you got to develop quickly. You got to be able to adjust to the speed quickly and if you don't, mm-hmm. there's 50 other guys that will take your spot. So it it's funny. So so quick story I was actually in training as in the military. So we were going through asymmetric warfare and we we're getting trained by Delta force. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, invariably, that cool. oh, invariably, that so cool, mate. <laughs> always, you always You've just made Brian Johnson less cool. <laughs> this, this goes with this story. Okay. okay anyway, cool. invariably somebody always asked the question, some dummy fives like, Hey, what's better? You know, like the seals, what do you guys do different? What's different between you, mm-hmm. you know, the Delta force, in the seals. Right. Mm -hmm. And there was one answer and it was perfect. We do the basics better than anyone. It's not about advanced. It's about the basics. Exactly what you just said. The way that you get to the next level is not trying to be the advanced, you know, dunk (laughs) or posterizing somebody. It's about the basics. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that that goes all the way through whether it's military sports, the corporate side of the house, right? Mm-hmm. Everything that we're talking about now, I think even has a feeling like, you know, training, how we go from one job to the next, they all just kind of like mix the same. You've got to get the basics, right? I agree completely, completely. And there's got to be a love for it that you're able that working at it is yeah. not work. It's fun. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the fundamentals working at it and enjoying it. Uh, yeah, all those things transfer to to no matter what you do. I, I completely agree. But in like, but you, you mentioned that you took baseball for granted, um, and it, it, did that do anything in terms of your development then? Because if you're just extremely extremely talented at something and you just take it for granted, do you, what does that mean? Like, um, and take it for granted could be to, to, to varying degrees. I definitely worked at it in college. But, okay. base, but football dominates in college, right? Uh, yes. There's spring football had to be it. Because, again, if I was like – so Deion Sanders uh, was coming out and Bo Jackson, they all we all were kind of around – they were a little bit older than me, mm-hmm. but I kind of aspired to be them. Okay. And I wanted to play both sports in the professional at the professional level. But then I realized over time, because everybody's like, oh, yeah, sure. Either, oh, yeah, sure, go for it, or there's no way you ever do it. So right. I, I love the no way you ever do it. I, I always like to remember that stuff. Uh-huh. But what happened was I realized that in order I couldn't do it as a quarterback because a quarterback has to be at every meeting, yeah, every every practice, oh, everything yeah. that has to be done. As a running back, you can just show up and play the next day. <laughs> as a as a cornerback, you can show up and play the next day. Essentially, not to not to yeah, yeah, yeah. Take, true, in, true. Not to take anything away from them, but as the game, no one is really coordinating with the running back. Yeah, there's some timing with the offensive lineman. Okay. But uh, the, the quarterback, everything centers around that position. So you can't have the quarterback not be there. So uh, once I realized that, that was a big deal. So uh, so that's why I kind of took baseball for granted a little bit. I was like, oh, I'm good, I, whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, But the problem was our team, our baseball team was so good. I sat on the bench a lot in college. Did you? And especially, <laughs> my fr- especially my freshman year. And I was pissed. I wasn't a great, a great, I didn't handle it real well. I was angry. My son, you know, sits on the bench now. He's playing college baseball. And every mm. once in a while, he'll sit on the bench and, and have to work his way up. He handles it so much better than I did. But I was pissed. I was angry. And um, so I think from a standpoint of I put so much time into football, uh, I kind of assumed baseball would always be there. I kind of assumed I could just click it on and get mm. after it. But the, the competition was so good. Our team was so good. I couldn't break the starting lineup for that first year. So, but what was nice about that experience, again, the whole idea of you don't have to everything be roses and compliments and, and you're the greatest thing ever. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I struggled. I, the first class I took in college, I flunked. 
because I wanted to play baseball and run and chase around the girls. But then I turned it around and no, played no. two sports. Huh? Yeah. But I turned around, played two sports, and graduated on time in four years with my degree. And so that was a good experience. My freshman year, I sat on the bench, both baseball and football. Football, I, I redshirted. Um, so it was good because I had to work at it and wait for my turn. Mm -hmm. So what was nice about kind of taking for baseball for granted and mm -hmm. so much football dominant in college is that once I decided, hey, baseball is going to be the sport that I choose, now my motivation and my enjoyment of the game is so much better because I played left field for two years. I was bored to tears. <laughs> bored to tears. Pick I was daisies. so bored. It couldn't even – because uh, what, what happened was when I showed up to the baseball field freshman year, been playing football for six weeks. Everybody else uh -huh. was playing together for during the fall season for six weeks. I show up in the spring. All the positions are taken, but right field. Yeah, we got a spot yeah. for you, Brian. <laughs> exactly. And now right field, those guys can play. Uh, anyway, so yeah. um, so my coach says, hey, have you ever played the outfield? I was like, I never played the outfield a day in my life. I was like, absolutely. I play it all the time. <laughs> and so I, I was out there in the outfield. So I backed up seven different positions at the college level. Wow. And wow. Except for catcher and second <laughs> baseman. I never, I never caught – a day in my college career, but then went on to be a catcher in, at the major league level. So you were the go, ultimate go uti utility guy. You could play everywhere. Just plug go and figure. play. Hey, <laughs> at athleticism, fundamentals <laughs> early on. But talk I mean, about talk about utility though, because you're talking about two sports that are completely different. You're talking yeah. about using different muscles, different timing. I mean, it is, it is completely different. So when you're prepping as a quarterback, right? I mean, that, that, that in itself is like a college course, right? Sure. You're prepping as a, as a, as a quarterback. And then, you know, you've got to get your, your we played muscle in, memory. We had three, three different offenses while I was there. God. <laughs> God. You got to learn a new one every year. It's, well, then you get your muscle memory in place for that one sport, right? And then you've got to go to the other one where, you know, obviously football, there's a lot. I mean, timing is, is everything, but baseball, obviously it is timing, right? Yeah. It, it yeah. is timing. So what was the difference there? Did you, is that one of the reasons why you knew you had to disconnect from the one that you were not going to go pro in, or at least have a chance to and say, okay, boom, I'm, this is this is my ride. I've got to focus yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's interesting you said, because the way I looked at it back then is baseball and football was really the same script of music, the same sheet of music. Mm. Just athletically, it just made sense to me, both of them. OK. But to your point, once I decided, I realized, hey, the, the, the key factor is that, hey, I can't play both professionally because I realize as a quarterback, my role, if I want to be a good quarterback, I have yeah. to be there. And so if I can't miss anything, because, uh, again, Bo goes off and plays baseball. Dion goes off and plays baseball at the Yankees. Bo goes plays baseball at the Kansas City Royals. Then they pop in late in training camp or the first couple of games, and they go play football. Quarterbacks can't do that. So once I realized that, then I had to pull away from my love of football, really focus on one, and get after it. And hopefully I didn't lose too much ground and maybe get a chance to play at the major league level. So uh, And I was a – my, so my junior year in uh, college, I was drafted as a third baseman. <laughs> <laughs> I was drafted as a third baseman by the New York Yankees. The, okay. Yankees had, the Yankees had taken John Elway four or five years earlier. Wow. And he, he was an outfielder, obviously, with a big cannon. And yeah. so George, George Steinbrenner was a big fan of the Stanford guy, of the Stanford oh. quarterback. So George Steinbrenner kind of had, a, uh, you know, an affiliation or not affiliation, but uh, enjoyed the idea of the Stanford quarterback. And so that's where I got some love. And they there was a local scout uh, in Sacramento from the Yankees that would come. And and anyway, so he he drafted me and the Yankees drafted me. And uh, sure enough, I go play rookie ball. I come back after my first year. Um, my agreement with the Yankees is that I'd be able to continue to play football and graduate. Uh, so I came back uh, from rookie ball with the Yankees, came back, played um, as a quarterback and had one of my best games at Arizona State, uh, playing against uh, Paul – What's Paul? So anyway, he was the, the leading passer in NCAA history at the time. Okay. Uh, I can't remember what his name was. But anyway, um, so it was against him. And we were driving. We were down by four points, fourth quarter. Had probably one of my best games of my career, a 65-yard touchdown, 85-yard touchdown. And then um, um, we were in a two-minute drill. My tight end's over there. 
Um, I feel the pressure coming from my backside. I throw the ball at my guys, my tight end's feet because he was covered and uh-huh. I was ready to take the hit. And so he picked me up. The linebacker got underneath me, picked me oh. up in the air and landed. My shoulder landed first and all my weight landed on, then all his weight landed on me. And my right shoulder just exploded. Oh. Um, I had a fifth degree separation. I had a, a clavicle that dislocated oh. posteriorly Damn. and my clavicle split in the joint, split like that. And uh, so uh, anyway, long story short, I, I recovered from that. Uh, but it's just it's just the you know, I've been told my whole life, oh, football, you're going to get hurt. Oh, football, you're going to get hurt. And I was like, no, I'm not going to get hurt. I'm Mr. Wonderful. I'll never, I'll never get hurt. <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a dumb kid. You know, I'm in, I, I, you can't hurt me. And so when I got hurt, that was another wake up call for me. It was like, oh, OK, showtime. Oh, because oh, what happened was I got hit, right? I'm yeah. landing on the turf. My shoulder exploded. I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know what happened. I literally rolled over at Arizona State in Tempe, Arizona, mm-hmm. rolled over 60,000 people in the stands. I rolled over, looked up in the sky. It's like, oh, my God, what did I do to my baseball career? Mm. Was, uh, that was the first, uh, was that that the first, first thing thought that came to my head. And so that's when I knew, OK, I'm supposed to be playing baseball. There it is. Wow. There it that's, is. That's the, the most unique intervention story I think I've ever heard. Like, <laughs> yes. I think. You had to get blindsided by a huge guy and, and, for you to separate your shoulder, for you to think, oh, actually. No, so Brian, I, w- I was curious because you, you, you sort of talked over it, the fact that you were uh, you know, a Division One athlete, both in baseball and football, and you were recruited by all these colleges. Now, Highly recruited. Highly recruited, actually. Highly. Yeah, because you were the star of the baseball team. You were a really good quarterback. But you get sort of, for me, the, the picture that comes to mind is you're playing, you're off, you're doing your training, you're exercising. And you've got these sort of scouts there and they're on the side of the pitch or the field and they're sort of lurking and they're sort of writing stuff down. And what was that like for you? And what was your first interaction with a scout maybe that really struck you? Yeah, um, good question. Um it's hard to well again as a young kid i'm in high school right mm-hmm. um the, we didn't really have a whole lot of interaction with that because remember back then the big rules was you can't even sniff professional stuff as a as an amateur athlete All right, so there, yeah. was, there was big big rules around that um and so the the college scouts were only allowed to speak to us through our head coach through our high school coach Okay. Okay. So I didn't have a whole lot of interaction with the scouts at the time. I knew they were there. Mm -hmm. I could tell they were there. You know, they sit behind the screen. You can tell who's sitting out there. (laughs) Yeah. It's usually always all old guys, you know. And so I would hear secondarily (laughs) about what they thought, but they wouldn't share a whole lot, but they would ask. You could get a feel for how they thought by the questions that they asked. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on a college, on the football side, I never got to see them. Well, except they would come like during lunchtime. And so, uh, you know, coaches would come. A lot of them were at the camp that I told you about. But coaches would come during lunchtime, so they'd call you down to the gym, you shake hands, and, hey, blah, 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 hey, we think you're really good. We'd love for you to come down to University of Southern California or UCLA or Washington or, or hmm. Michigan. I went down a Michigan trip. It was really interesting. A guy almost died on us, but whatever. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but, but whatever. But, yeah, so – I didn't have a whole lot of interaction. Again, my um, consigliere, not consigliere, but my my liaison, yeah. my unofficial agent was my high school coach. So he kind of vetted people. He kind of was there. Okay. We were really close. He's like a father figure for me. So he was kind of the liaison. And also my football coach, mm. uh, Tony Fardella, was the football coach. Um, Joe Pinella, uh, two Italian guys, were, uh, were my coaches there. And they were really the ones that were – kind of the filters before they they got to me so it wasn't until later on where i became a college player and then yeah. a professional player and then actually a scout where i really appreciated more as to what the you know what that process was so no movie high school like every movie we see right? it's like you know they the coaches come into the come into the the, the living room and they look the mom and dad square in the eye and they say, yeah. your boy's going to be fine with us. Yeah. Right. That didn't happen. None of that happened. No, no, that happened. Uh, okay. 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 See yeah. You. yeah. So the movies, <laughs> yes. the movies are always right. Aren't they? Cool. Yes. I the, <laughs> the, the, say the, best, the best one. Yes. Was a guy named Jerry Kendall. He was, okay. a, he was university of Arizona college baseball coach. Uh-huh. And he brought his wife 
and he was a nice, kind man. He came to my parent to my house, my parents' house, and spoke with all of us and had a great time and just had really nice things to say about me. And I ended up not going there, but that process was pretty was pretty interesting. Everybody else kind of came through the school, so no one else came to the house. Okay. Um, but then, so the um, personal touch, yeah, yeah. But then when I signed with the Yankees, that was when I was in college, right? So yeah. I had I had breakfast with a with the the Yankee scout, which was kind of intimidating, and um, <laughs> and he was, was a he, guy what, that was he from New York or where, where was he from? Yeah, he was no, he's from Sacramento, which is you know, okay, uh, uh, a couple hours north of where I was at Stanford. And uh, so I didn't really like him because he didn't give me everything that I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a 16th round pick. I wanted first round money. And that, for some reason, they were they just weren't <laughs> they weren't feeling that. I don't, I don't know. Why. So strange. I don't but, I don't know why. No. But they did give me four years of college uh, uh, of tuition when I was done playing, whenever that may be. I could utilize that. So that was kind of where I was able to cash in a little bit. I never used it. I was going to use it to go to law school, but different story. Um, but what's interesting is that guy, and I can't mm-hmm. remember his name to save my life right now, but Yankee scout, mm-hmm. uh, when I became a scout, I ran into him 30 years later. Wow. And I met with him in Detroit. It happened to be Detroit, uh, in the press box. Cause that's where all the, the pro scouts kind of meander and, and, and get food before the game and all that. <laughs> and, um, so I saw him one day and we chit chatted. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was in Toronto. It was Toronto. And so we chit chatted and I was like, Hey man, I said, let me tell you something. Thank you so much for believing in me and giving me a chance to play baseball. I didn't say that to you before. Cause I was a dumb kid and I was mad cause you didn't give me enough money. Yeah. And I've never run into you since then, but now I have a chance. Thank you for giving me a chance it was a great ride. And, and if, if, you know, for that moment in time, if you hadn't have done that, I might have had not have had the opportunity. So it was a uh-huh. great opportunity to be able to say thank you to somebody that was important. And he didn't ask you what your name was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's just going, sorry, sorry, who are you? <laughs> no, no, he, well, now see, he got, he got a lot of praise for me because I was 16th round pick. Yeah, yeah most, so most, most 16th round picks don't make it to the big leagues. There we go. You and were probably a, good for his career. Yeah. That's a feather in his cap where so, he said that as well is that, hey, you helped me out quite a bit because blah, 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 blah. So, yeah. Mutually yeah. beneficial. Yeah. Mutually yeah, so. beneficial. But he did remember my name, Chad. And that was, that was, <laughs> even, that was even better. That was uh, even even more of a, of a monumental moment that he didn't say, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> Have we met? <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, you know, those, those guys have to be on their game because they see so many people. Yeah. Um, so many athletes constantly. I mean, not just year after year, but week after week. Right. Yeah. And then all yeah. the, uh, the, the research that they have to do and whatnot. So yes. When I, when I was sure. a scout, I did, uh, uh, 1200 reports a year on one player, oh. so 1200 <laughs> individual reports in one, in one season. Uh, did you say on one player? No, 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 I'm sorry. Twelve hundred okay. individual. Okay, thank you. Reports oh, for individual. Still, play. that's wow. insane. That yeah. is amazing. That is amazing. Well, kids, we'll get into that into future episodes. That's just a little <laughs> tease. Just yeah. a little tease. Uh, but Brian, uh, you know, again, thanks again for being co-host. I'm not going to thank Jasper. Uh, we <laughs> <Fine>. appreciate. <laughs> Appreciate you, you you giving some of some of the stories, man. I mean, it, it, one of the things that when Jasper approached me about doing this podcast, uh, I got excited was for these conversations because hmm. nobody's having these conversations. They're not going deep enough to find no. out who the people are, and, and 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 hopefully we'll get a chance to to find out a little bit more about Brian Johnson, not just in this episode, but in the many other episodes that we'll be able to do. So. I appreciate, I appreciate that, but I got to be honest, this is not my favorite episode. I want to hear all the other guests that we get. I want <laughs> to hear excited. their stories. I'm excited. Yeah, I, I think, I, I think I, like, like you said, like it's so important because we talk about these sports stars and we we talk about the Shohei Otanis of the world and we talk about all mm-hmm. these big guys, but we don't really talk about the guys who discovered them. And that's like, they're the ones that have actually 
done a lot of work the 1200 True. reports yeah um so like to give them a platform that would be that would just be great they're, they're the you, sorcerers I, yeah, <laughs> yeah they are yeah. And, and i think what you're gonna find is a lot of folks there's different stories too but some people mm -hmm. but most every one of i think the people that we're going to be interviewing really appreciate just as i did later on uh really appreciate those other people that helped along the way. So it'd be, it's going to be a lot of fun to hear those stories uh, from everybody else. Just to be able to watch them reflect, I think yeah. for me, that's yeah. is, is pretty amazing, right? Listening yeah. to the stories, amazing, but just the watching you go through it and just like you can see you reflecting on those stories, that to me is magic. So again, Brian, we appreciate it. Thank you. Next time, guys, we will be back. Uh, Chad, Jasper, and Brian, we're going to have, uh, obviously, more discussions like this. Uh, I mean, Brian's already Brian's already uh, pitched. Uh, he's dropped names like Gary Payton, uh, Dennis Green. <laughs> I mean, it's... George Dennis is, died. Dennis died. We can't get him. That'd be, that'd be we, a weird we'll podcast, man. Out. We will get the Ouija board out. <laughs> For Dennis Green, I promise. Yeah, Excellent, right. guys. I appreciate it. We'll talk again soon. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Talent Chasing with Brian Johnson, Chad Sowash, and Jasper Spanjar. Don't forget to subscribe to Talent Chasing on your favorite podcast platform. We'll see you next time.